it's a wonderful read. As well as this book on the Revolutionary War as it came in Manhattan. There's so many things that are been discussed here today and will be discussed here today. This is an opportunity for you to tell a remembrance of Bill Casey. I see so many people out in the audience who were part of the Reagan administration and before that, other administrations in which Bill participated. You've got to have some stories. And we're here to celebrate, not only to recognize his life, but celebrate his life. And we can do that by drawing on your insights and your experiences. And I've asked that the kickoff in answering and telling such a story start with Judge Stan Sport. Thank you. 
took the right place. And the third at the right time. I've got a story about Bill Casey that combines uh, both the SEC and the OSS. I've had the pleasure of working with Bill in a variety of his incarnations. The only time I ever got paid for it was when I was at the SEC. Bill called me and said, uh, I want you to come implement a uh, program to get the Congress to adopt uh, became the Securities Acts Amendments in 1975, a 400-page bill that revamped Wall Street. Wall Street hated it. It took us a year to put it together and three years to get it to the Congress. And when we were testifying on the bill, I, Bill and I were going up to Congress. You have to understand something about the bill. Bill didn't like the Congress slightly more than he didn't like him because And in any case, um, we were going up to the hill, oh, yeah. and uh, we were in the back of the car. And I always think about Bill talking about the SEC before congressional testimony. And the, the uh, Wall Street Journal always referred to Bill's congressional testimony as him being a tough and testy witness. And he was. He, he was one of the rare witnesses who intimidated the committee. And we were in the back of the car going up to the hill. And uh, I said, you know, Bill, I'm sorry I'm not 20 years older than I am. My French was very good. And I could have uh, worked for you in the OSS behind enemy lines in enemy occupied France. And as our car was passing between two congressional office buildings, Bill leaned over and said to me, Ted, we're behind enemy lines right now. <laughs> I just want to say this one quick thing. Bill Casey was the greatest human being I have ever known, and I am very lucky part of this.
Many of you might have known a lawyer here in town, Lori Lieberman. And uh, Lori Lieberman said, hey, I want you to meet a guy who knows more about the revelation that war than you do. And uh, uh, I talked to him, he certainly did. He didn't know everything about the revelation that war. He says, and also, he has, he has a bigger role in that than I have. And uh, both of these people, everybody who was anybody. So I got to know uh, him uh, here in Buckley. Later in 1974, I was in Geneva working on negotiating the Soviets. And I got a visit uh, from the Bill who had been in Sierra. And uh, he stopped on the way home. And uh, he uh, said, you know, and he said, I just can't to see the child of God. He's finished. What do you mean finished? He's part of it. He's growing great. He's a great friend. And I said, you know, he said that he's going to be replaced by a total opening. I said, who is he? He said, well, he's a, a Muslim leader out there in Paris. And uh, I said, well, that's, that's very interesting. He said, besides, he said, Charles um, is ill. Juliana, I thought, how do you 
you know, but of course, this was a real case. You know, everything. So, Juliana, I just wanted you to know that tomorrow morning the president is going to do a radio address and we'll be using your background to announce the expulsion of those damn spies from the United Nations. And that is when I first learned that active measures was not something only the Soviet Union did. <laughs> that must have been a thrill. Yes, come on up. Well, as you can tell from my long trip from the back of the room, this is not premeditated. Uh, but I thought it important that someone who had worked with Bill over an extended period at the CIA should tell a story or two. Although I've been retired now for three years, I remember vividly the years I spent working with Bill Casey. Uh, throughout the six years, he was our director from January 81 to January 87. Uh, a couple of lessons, uh, object lessons, I took away, I'll share with you. One of them is that at one point, uh, I was the director of analysis for Latin America. And to make a long story short, our Secretary of State, George Shultz, had gotten a bit of an argument with the Australian Foreign Minister at the UN in New York. And Shultz came back to Washington and called Casey and said, could you send someone to Australia to brief the Foreign Minister on why we think as we do on the Nicaraguan issues? And this, I think, was the first direct phone call I'd had from our director in this capacity. Uh, Director Casey called me in my office and he said, I'd John, I'd like you to go to Australia and brief the foreign minister on Nicaragua. And knowing nothing whatsoever of the background, I said, well, of course, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, when would you like it done? And he said, well, I think it's too late to leave today. <laughs> but, but he made something of a habit, as some of you will know, back in those days, reading among everything else, airline guides, thick ones, you know, flights everywhere in the world, and he knew them. But he said, I think if you leave uh, tomorrow, uh, you can get there via Los Angeles and uh, Sydney to Canberra. Well, I didn't do it literally tomorrow, but within a couple of days, indeed, I left Washington, uh, went to Los Angeles, Sydney, Canberra, had two long sessions with the foreign minister, got on a plane and found a way to return via New Zealand. Hawaii, but in Hawaii there was a downtime of about six hours. So I checked into a hotel, it's not easy going to Australia and back and no notice, but our custom in the agency is you let headquarters know where you are. So they, I had sent a cable saying, well here I am, you know, for a few hours, and, and then I took flight to California and a red eye back to Washington, arrived at seven o'clock on a Sunday morning. To my surprise, the airline gave me a note, said, call the director at home. So I called Director Casey at home on a Sunday morning. He, of course, probably been up for hours. But he said, John, I hear you've been vacationing in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I had ever needed it. This was the evidence of several things. One of them is that Bill Casey was the hardest working man I had ever worked for. The other was that he was a shy man, but compassionate and insightful, and this was his way really of saying thank you uh, for a job well done in Australia. Now just one other story I'll tell you, and that what related also to foreign travel. Uh, I traveled with Director Casey a great deal because I oversaw analysis at different times on Middle East, Latin America, and Africa. But on one long trip, overnight trip from Washington to West Africa, I was having trouble sleeping at one o'clock in the morning, so my light was still on in the plane of reading a novel. And Bill came forward from his cabin in the back of this large aircraft, and seeing one light on, he came up and said, John, why are you reading that? It was a novel from the 
airport. I said, well, I just, you know, couldn't sleep. He said, well, of course not. Come on back here. So I went back to his cabin, and he gave me some long document on the relationship between economic development and political stability in Africa. I said, John, could you read this? And then let's, let's talk this through. Uh, he said, you know, this stuff is important. He said, we've just, this was one year into, into the administration. He said, we've just got seven years to get this right. Well, there really was something profound. This was the only man I ever knew or worked for who arose every day thinking, how today can I change the course of world history? Whether it was Central America or Africa or the Soviet Union or the Middle East, he really wanted to change the course of history. And I have never worked for such an individual. Thank you. Thank you. on the team. Uh, in my mind, one of the greatest achievements of Bill Casey that did indeed change history was his effort with Bill Clark to connect Ronald Reagan with Pope John Paul VI. And that was an historic alliance that indeed did lead to, I believe, the downfall of the Soviet Union. And Bill Casey was absolutely essential and in the forefront of that effort to make that alliance. And I was in Switzerland as ambassador when it started and when there were demonstrations on, on both sides. In fact, it was the one time I thought my car would be hijacked uh, because the, uh, the uh, organizers uh, of the anti-solidarity movement were so strong and numerous and powerful that I, I really thought that, that I was not going to get through even though I was in an unmarked car. But um, looking back at history, I think that was uh, the key alliance that, that led to the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. Then the next thing I wanted to relate about Bill Casey uh, was the importance he placed on winning in Central America and making an effort despite fero ferocious opposition from even inside the Republican Party on that subject and in the career bureaucracy as well. Because Ronald Reagan had said, if we lose in Central America, we lose in Geneva. And so Casey was an absolute uh, stalwart on, on, and, and unafraid of the tremendous opposition. He would brave it uh, despite its uh, ferocity because he knew it was the right thing to do. And one of my jobs in the White House was to lead the Central American Outreach Program, which played an effort in, in, uh, in the form of Congress and hopefully urging them to do the right thing. The third thing I wanted to relate is one time in early 86, he came into my office, as he sometimes did in the White House, and plumped down on my sofa. He felt at home there, and he could talk to me, friend to friend. And he was sad because he's, he had a lot of successes, but everything didn't always go his way. And on this occasion, it was the 30th anniversary coming up of the Hungarian Revolution. And he really wanted to make a, uh, a significant recognition of what had been done in Eastern Europe at that time. And he had been thwarted in the internal bureaucracy 
and he came in and he looked sad and we talked and we did finally have some minor um, celebration or recognition but he he saw the importance of Eastern Europe and how it would how vitally important it was to make it free and he gave his life for this mission his life work was not to contain the Soviet Union but to defeat the evil empire as was wrong <coughs> Super short, but it's an unknown uh, aspect of his life. He encouraged Anthony Fisher, who had met in London, and Sir Anthony Fisher was an Englishman who started a think tank in England to start a think tank in New York. We were called now today to the Manhattan Institute that produced two books that were part of the sort of the Reagan readers, Losing Ground by Charles Murray and Wealth and Poverty by George Gilder. That gave Sir Anthony Fisher the courage to start an organization to think tanks all over the world that would pay attention to free markets, not only uh, defense. So this is a tribute to this great man that inspired Anthony Fisher to start this great network to promote freedom around the world. So thank you all for the work you have done, and especially to all the Smith family here. story about Bill Casey at the SEC or the CIA or the broad at the times that he was uh, an attorney. We have one coming right now. I'll give you a story about uh, the campaign. I was Bill Casey's driver. Uh, name's Tom Casey, but there's no relationship. And you know, we, a, lot, a lot was discussed this morning about his intellect, and I have never seen anything like it. There was always a stack in the back seat next to newspapers and books. Many of the books in the, the IWP library I probably picked up for him at Sidney Kramer Books, where he did have a charge account, and a man whose mandate was to just buy him anything that looked interesting. Uh, but I think at, at that time, and I can also tell you about the vocabulary I learned from Mr. Casey, particularly a, a drive to Dulles Airport with Bill Simon, where I heard they, these guys did not use the seven dirty words. They made up their own. <laughs> it was really phenomenal. But, you know, even as a Calo 22 year old, I could tell that he was a very unusual person. The relationship that I saw with Mrs. Casey and the delight that he took and talking about his daughter were really quite something. But he was also just a tremendously nice man. My first day on the job, I drove him down to Richmond from the headquarters in Arlington for a fundraiser at the governor's mansion. He, of course, needed to read and work on the way down there and back, so Barbara came with us. And on the way back, we stopped at a Howard Johnson's in Fredericksburg. And for an hour and a half, we did not talk campaign not talk about business with Barbara. Bill Casey, the, the head of the campaign, talked to me for an hour and a half about me and my life. And I was just really just doing it. it. This was an incredibly nice thing to do. Now, he was always disappointed in my navigation skills. He's always saying, Dom, Dom, you don't have that map yet? I never did. But finally, you know, to say he was a hard worker is just not half the story. There was an uh, apartment complex in, uh, I guess, I in Arlington, called Skyline, where the campaign had a bunch of apartments, and where I would pick up Mr. Casey every morning at 7 or 7. And one morning I arrive, and the fire alarm has gone off at probably 6 o'clock. And sitting out there in their bathrooms, 
Ambassador Carmen, Drew Lewis, Jim Baker, the aforementioned Max Shugel, all of the senior management of the campaign in their bathrobes when they left the building at six for the fire alarm. Mr. Casey, suit and tie briefcase, sitting there in the curb and working. <laughs>
money all the way through there. Uh, that's an awesome. asset. Yeah. I wish we could just run it out of the camera for us. I this guy who said he was going to keep plugging the extra bar because I don't know if you're going to try to jump through. Yeah, they keep losing audio. I can take over and head out. I should be pushing me.
fortunate in this one because I was out of the bed for the institute. This is not working. Is this working? Huh? Speak more into it? Okay. we got to be careful. Uh, so, but uh, our next uh, item on our agenda is the keynote. You can't hear it. You can't hear me. Uh, is there any room to stand? They're going to bring up the volume. I apologize. I'm not speaking close enough to the mic. I should be able to talk to a crowd this size without a mic, but I, I will try. Um, the uh, build as the keynote, and certainly is the keynote, although every talk we've had here has been a keynote, is a remarks by a person who is known, Ronald Reagan, certainly longer than anybody else in this room, because I'd like to introduce him as having been the spokesman for Ronald Reagan uh, and for his philosophies, his theories, since he was governor of the state of California. And I, I, uh, I, you know, he has really been uh, the principal person ever since he out of office, going around the country speaking on behalf of events for Ronald Reagan and the movement of Ronald Reagan's And of course I'm talking about somebody who, I, somebody told me I should list all the positions and offices that he's held. If I did that, we would be here all afternoon and into the evening, and he, we would still wouldn't have heard from the Attorney General. So I'm just going to say, since 1979, the Mises and the Casey's have been very close friends. And I've been privileged since 1979 to call Ed and Ursula, who could not be with us today, Ed and Ursula, very close friends. And they, he served Ronald Reagan probably as much as Casey, he was re he's responsible for the fact that Ronald Reagan became president of the United States. And he certainly put that together, and I think he may have even put it right away in the year, making a change of what uh, the going to the campaign. But I'm going to ask him to come up and talk about that. The greatest campaign, certainly, of my life. And, uh, and of course, I'm speaking about it. <laughs> each of us here in one way or another. Even those who didn't know him, because of what he did for our country, uh, he had touched uh, all of you. And I think it's great that, uh, that John Lanchowski with the Institute of World Politics, and particularly Owen and Bernadette, uh, have made this all possible to bring us all together. As a matter of fact, as I look around, it's almost like a, a Reagan reunion here uh, with uh, so many of you here. I had the privilege of serving with uh, Bill in the administration, the campaign, and so many others that I know have uh, worked with him, served with him, or were friends of his uh, during other portions of his life. Uh, we've had some great expositions of, of Bill's work uh, and uh, the various uh, positions he held. Uh, and we'll have more as we talk about uh, the campaign, his contributions to the country. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about Bill Casey, the man. Some of you may remember, uh, years ago, the Reader's Digest had a column every month and it was entitled, The Most Unforgettable Character I've Ever Met. Now, they don't have that column anymore, but I can't think of a better candidate for it than Bill Casey, uh, if that column was still around, because of the uh, amazing, in many ways, uh, characteristics of Bill, all that he accomplished, and all the things that, that went on. Uh, just think of the different things you've heard already today, and all the jobs or positions or ways in which uh, he'll be remembered. As a lawyer, as a businessman, as an editor and publisher, as an entrepreneur, as a philanthropist, as an author, as a naval officer, as a prominent Catholic layman, as a political leader, as a congressional candidate, a campaign director, 
an intelligence officer, and I could go on and on. Uh, so many other things you've already heard about today. But I would uh, think that the thing about uh, Bill that was uh, tremendous uh, was the fact that he was one of the great intellects that I've ever met. Now, uh, John, uh, earlier today, John Lenchowski talked about his library. When I visited him at his home in Long Island uh, and saw this massive library of books, uh, what was really impressive to me was Bill had read every one. And uh, I think most of us in our libraries can probably make that same statement. As a matter of fact, the, the library was so vast that at one time, Bernadette, I think this is correct, uh, I think he hired your aunt, uh, his uh, sister, uh, either his sister or uh, Sophia's sister, to actually catalog the library. So even he would know uh, what he had in it there. But uh, as, as John pointed out, the, the library to me was symbolic of the intellectual depth that Bill had in which uh, Stan also talked about. He was indeed a, an avid reader. Uh, that's why he was picking up all these hard books, hard book, uh, as well as, as newspapers and everything else as we used to travel together. Uh, Stan said he was the smartest man he's ever met, and I would certainly agree. And one thing that Bill had was an intellectual curiosity. Uh, he was interested in almost everything, and uh, as was pointed out, he not only read everything about everything, but he remembered everything about everything. And so when he had a problem before him, he probably read something about it, and he could quote almost verbatim what he had read, uh, and that was a great help to him in, in all the things that, that he did. And so that was a, a very valuable aspect. This was summed up in a comment that was made about, in two comments that were made about him in uh, one of the articles that were written about Bill uh, shortly after he passed. One article said he was a man consistently ahead of his time. And the other said that he had, that he was a man of magnificent complexity and intellectual voraciousness. And I think that really describes Bill and what he did. I don't know whether you noticed this morning, but symbols of his service to the country uh, were in front of us as we were watching the different talks there. And that were the three flags that stood on the opposite side from the American flag. Uh, the flag of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the flag of the Export-Import Bank, and the flag, of course, of the Central Intelligence Agency. I think it would be fair to say that all the things that Bill did, uh, as Owen kind of referred to a minute ago, uh, one of the most important things that he did was to participate as the director of the Reagan campaign in 1980. Now we're going to talk about that in the panel shortly, so I'm not going to go in too much to all the details of the campaign itself, but I really believe that if Bill had not stepped in and been available at that particular time and stepped in, uh, I don't believe that Ronald Reagan would have become president of the United States. His, his contribution uh, was that important. Indeed, uh, during the, the campaign, and, and that was the time when, when I first met Bill, actually, uh, was in January of 1980. I attended a meeting of what was then known as the Kitchen Cabinet. These were the men who had supported Ronald Reagan when he ran for governor uh, back in, uh, in 1966. And they had been kind of a group of informal advisors and also a group of uh, rather influential fundraisers uh, who had worked with him uh, ever since that time. And uh, they were having a meeting as they did periodically. And I went there and George Champion, some of you may remember George, a prominent New Yorker and, and the uh, head of, that, of one of the large paper companies. And uh, George had brought this uh, stranger to the group who had worked in the Nixon campaign and felt that he might have some contributions that he could make uh, to the campaign as they were discussing uh, the early days of the campaign then. And uh, I was so impressed with his contribution. He had been the head of the policy development uh, wing of the, uh, of the uh, Nixon campaign, taking the issues and writing up issue papers and providing ideas to the candidate at that time. And so he uh, gave a little talk about uh, dealing with the issues that come up and dealing a little bit with the campaign. And I was so impressed that uh, I asked him if he would uh, have dinner uh, with me that, that night, and we got together and we talked. And uh, he had, as I say, he, he had been through a campaign, a successful campaign in 1968, and so I thought he would be a, a good person to have available to, to, President, to then Governor Reagan uh, and to the rest of us who were, who were involved one way or another in the campaign. And so it wasn't long after that that I took him up uh, in New Hampshire, Jerry Carmen, remember, 
uh, and uh, introduced him uh, to the, the governor. And uh, uh, then uh, not much more happened until uh, a particular uh, event occurred when the, president, uh, the governor determined it was necessary to re reinvigorate and reorganize the campaign. And uh, they were looking for someone who had, uh, uh, I would say, gray hair, uh, but uh, gray hair meaning experience in campaigns. And uh, the governor uh, asked Bill if he would take over that, uh, the campaign. And indeed he did. And Bill was, as many people have talked about, was decisive, and that was, of course, part of, the, of his value, uh, but many other, had many other qualities. And one of the things that he did was uh, to come in the middle of a campaign. And if uh, you remember in those days, uh, the president uh, had lost the Iowa caucuses. Uh, there was a considerable turmoil within the campaign, which may be explored at greater length later on uh, when we discuss the, the campaign itself and the election. Uh, and there was the need for a real leader uh, to be the to take over and come in from the outside and, and to reorganize things. And, to, and the first task that, that Bill had was to talk to about a dozen regional political directors, all of whom were real political pros. They'd all been in lots of campaigns before, and so uh, uh, they met in a uh, in what began as a at least a questioning, if not actually a hostile session. Uh, at one of the airports, and Bill, uh, with his ability to to uh, articulate uh, what his vision was of the campaign, and to explain why unity, cooperation, and an effective strategy was necessary, brought these political pros together and brought them over in support of the ongoing campaign in a magnificent fashion, uh, which showed his ability uh, to lead and to also handle uh, skeptical and, and questioning folks, uh, as he did so effectively then. Well, that started off, of course, on a series of campaign travels where he and I generally traveled together, and it was quite an experience to see Bill travel. Uh, those of you, and there are some here who have been with him, know that Bill travels light. Uh, he would go for three or four weeks on end with only the clothes and other accessories that he could back uh, pack into a sm relatively small uh, a bag, uh, a carpet bag. It actually was a carpet bag. Uh, and he could carry that with him any place. And what he did, he had two suits. One he was wearing, and one that he had rolled Navy style and stuck into that carpet bag. And then he had the other uh, necessary uh, small, arm, small quantities of clothing and shirts. Now, shirts were a different matter. Because shirts, as you know, get dirty and have to be cleaned frequently. Well, Bill would send his, when we were in a place for two days or three days, he'd send the, sh the shirts out to be cleaned. The problem is he would leave town without picking up the shirts. <laughs> and if anyone would get the schedule of our travels uh, through the spring of 1980, you could probably find a series of cleaners around the country who still have Bill Casey shirts <laughs> hanging waiting for him to be, pick them up. But Bill was, uh, was uh, you know, uh, just, uh, I would say that he would work uh, 18 hours a day uh, often uh, and was, uh, even at a relatively advanced age at that time, uh, certainly was, uh, would have the energy and the, uh, the stamina of people uh, much uh, younger in age. Uh, and this, of course, was, for all of us, uh, was really a great example for all of us. And he used this tremendous uh, intellectual capabilities that I was mentioning to really uh, provide the kind of leadership that was necessary, uh, bringing together uh, all the different uh, mechanisms that are involved in a political campaign in which much of your decision making has to occur kind of on the road, on the hoof, uh, as you're going along, as crises would come in. And for a person who had uh, not really directed a campaign before, although he had been involved, but also a person who had not worked with Ronald Reagan before. Uh, the two uh, really admired each other and found a common uh, work together, the ability to work together very effectively and very cooperatively. And Ronald Reagan uh, was soon uh, learned that he could always depend on Bill uh, for sound advice and for an objective view of things. And so that was a tremendous help uh, in the campaign to, to the candidate at that time, and certainly was, was great for the rest of us. 
One of the things that Bernadette mentioned this morning in her remarks was that, that, that Bill and Sophia, his wife, were a team. And nowhere did this come more into evidence than in the campaign. Because uh, we had moved in August, we had, after the convention, we moved the headquarters from Los Angeles uh, to Washington, D.C. And so uh, Bill and Sophia and uh, a few of the rest of us were in the campaign, we all took up a residence, essentially, in the Skyline Apartments there in, in Alexandria. And one of the things that I remember very clearly was Sophia's contribution. We started the day rather early, like 7.30. And so that meant that at 6.30, Bill and I often were having breakfast together with maybe one or two others members of the campaign staff. And Sophia was always up every time we met in their apartment there. She was always up making breakfast for us at something like 6 or 6.30 in the morning, which I thought was a, a devotion of a wife that was above and beyond the call of duty at least in my own marital experience. <laughs> but what was most interesting in that particular situation was the Skyline Apartments had just been built, and they had a fire alarm which would often go off in the middle of the night. And there's no sight that you want to see that is more strange than to see Bill and Sophia going down 16 floors on the stairways and because of the fire alarm, and when you have a fire alarm, you know you can't use the elevators, and then having to trudge up. But that didn't, didn't stop them at all. And the next morning at 6.30, breakfast would be waiting for us as we got together and continued with the work of the campaign. Well, uh, you know, there, there's so many stories that can be told. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, particularly impressed me this morning uh, was a story that was a, a comment that went back to Hugh Montgomery and talked about the how Bill distinguished himself in, in, in the OSS. Well, he carried this on also uh, in his work, obviously, when the, the campaign was over and uh, Ronald Reagan became president, and his contributions to the NSC and his advice to the president. And he was, uh, he really cemented that relationship between a president and the intelligence community of the uh, federal government. And Bill was not just in charge of the CIA. He was both by statute but also by practice the director of Central Intelligence, a, 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 an organizational uh, mode that had started in 1947 with the uh, National Security Act, and which quite frankly, I think in many ways, having the director uh, who was responsible for the CIA also being the director of the intelli entire intelligence community was in many ways a superior arrangement to what we have today. That's parenthetical. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think that, that he really was, and he did a great job of bringing the various elements together in the intelligence community. And a good portion of his time was spent actually in the director of, uh, of the community's office, in the executive office building uh, next to the White House. And so, but it was particularly his advice to the president, and then his ability to, tran to translate that and to implement the this president's decisions as far as the intelligence community was concerned that was particularly valuable. And one of the things that Bill particularly, uh, actually two things, but one particularly uh, from an operational standpoint uh, that he was very much involved in, uh, and this may come up uh, later on in discussions of his contributions in terms of, of uh, national security, uh, but was the whole situation in Afghanistan. And much of our ability to support the freedom fighters in Afghanistan, uh, we'll put aside what, where they are and what their positions are today, but at that time, it was very important in the Cold War, in the battle against the Soviet Union, that we support the freedom fighters in Afghanistan and stop the aggression of the Soviet Union in that part of the world. And it was Bill, uh, particularly, who was a stalwart advocating the provision of stingers, the uh, ground-to-air missiles, that essentially made it impossible for the Soviets to use their helicopters in Afghanistan. Now, many of you saw the movie, probably Charlie's War, uh, Charlie Wilson's War. Well, uh, there's no question that Congressman Wilson was very important, essentially keeping Congress off the backs of the CIA during that period of time. But the person who really made it work uh, was Bill was Bill Casey, and, and that that probably more than anything else stymied the Soviet Union and ended a very important segment uh, of the Cold War and of the, con of the uh, 
uh, way in which we were able to ultimately uh, bring about the defeat of the Soviet Union. I would say that, that uh, one of the qualities that, that uh, Bill exhibited throughout his life was facilitating the work of others. When I mentioned earlier he was a philanthropist, indeed he was. Uh, just a couple of examples. Oh, by the way, the other thing that, uh, that in, the, in his job as Director of Central Intelligence, he was very critical, and again, this may come up later too, but that was in fostering a relationship and a method of communication uh, with the Vatican uh, and, and with the Pope uh, through the papal nuncio, nuncio uh, there in Washington, D.C. He and Bill Clark, uh, being both of the Catholic faith, were in a very good position to foster that. And while it's not nearly uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, all-inclusive, comprehensive as some of the books have been written, uh, they didn't sit down every morning and decide what the strategy of the, of the day would be between the Vatican and, and the White House. But there's no question the communication and the, the uh, way in which they discussed their common objectives was a very important factor in ultimately uh, with Margaret Thatcher uh, and a few others uh, bringing, bringing about the, the successful end of the Cold War from the standpoint of the West and ultimately the implosion of the Soviet Union. But going back to what I mentioned about Bill being a philanthropist and, found, and being a supporter of others, uh, he was, for example, uh, the co-founder of the Manhattan Institute. Uh, he was also uh, one of the earliest contributors to enable Bill Buckley to uh, launch the National Review. And there's several other publications. But the thing about Bill was throughout his lifetime, he was always available, particularly in conservative matters, or matters that, of faith and things that were important to him, whether it was uh, uh, Catholic colleges or uh, Catholic orders, as well as uh, various other educational and political enterprises. Bill was always there to lead in terms of the philanthropy, as well as to lead in terms of advice and support, which was badly needed uh, in the department. Uh, Bill was the first person to hold the job of Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs. And so in order to do that, they were building a new office for him in the State Department. And one day, uh, he had not yet moved in, he was in a temporary office, and one day, the contractor who was in charge of the building uh, rushed in uh, very dis distressed and upset and uh, said, uh, Mr. Casey, we've got a problem. And Bill said, what's the problem? He said, well, we mismeasured, and your office is about five square feet larger than the Secretary of State's office. <laughs> and those of you who know the State Department know that this is a capital offense <laughs> and, and uh, violates all the protocols. And so Bill took about 30 seconds and he said, uh, tell me, uh, in that corner over there, could you build a closet four feet by four feet and put a door in? And the contractor said, yeah, I guess we could. Okay, in that case, my, my, my office falls within the specifications because that's a different room. <laughs> you know, uh, Bill had, had so many fine qualities. Uh, somebody mentioned he was a hard worker, and I always already had mentioned that he was a uh, work night and day, literally, uh, particularly during the campaign. And they, it was also mentioned that he was decisive in this, and he was decisive, but he always he was always willing to listen and he didn't shoot from the hip or make his decisions without really considering all the information that was available and seeking information uh, during the campaign particularly and of course later on. But during the campaign, there were a lot of important decisions that had to be made and Bill was willing to listen to anybody. Uh, it, it, it didn't have to be one of his immediate coterie of assistants. Uh, it could be anybody in the campaign uh, who had a, a an opportunity or should have an opportunity and had something to contribute. And then he would grind that into his thinking and come out with, with a clear decision. And as you know in, in politics, uh, a lot of times uh, the decisions you make uh, may or may not be right, but they've got to be made right then. And that was such an important part of having someone at the helm uh, who was able to make those decisions and keep the, the, uh, the uh, whole campaign running effectively and efficiently and also uh, being able to make a decision which had the input from others so that they felt part of the decision because there's nothing like a, a combination of political people in a campaign uh, that where you haven't seen the clash of egos uh, as, uh, as we experienced there and which Bill was so good at making timely and accurate decisions 
uh, which certainly was a settling factor in bringing that campaign together. Stan mentioned that, that, uh, that Bill was a good writer. And I think this is a very interesting aspect of his life because writing, like reading, was an important part of his character. And it really all got started in his early years. Uh, as many of you know, uh, he graduated from college in the middle of the Depression and then went to law school. And there weren't too many jobs for lawyers uh, during the Depression. And Bill found a particular niche, and that was in analyzing the new tax laws and the new regulations which were coming out uh, in great volume. You remember this was the high day of, of the New Deal. And so he uh, was able to take these uh, documents, these regulations and these laws that were coming out daily and analyze them and summarize them and put them into these loose leaf books that were critical to lawyers, whether they were estate lawyers or, or tax lawyers or trust lawyers, whatever it happened to be, all of which, uh, because there was so much new material coming out every day, they needed this, this documentation right away. And so he made uh, a great living, actually, during the Depression out of uh, analyzing these and putting them out in these uh, tax reporters. Uh, which went out on a loose leaf basis so that they'd be available to, to lawyers. And of course, it was that, uh, that uh, quality and that, that character of uh, his uh, ability to write, which also led to his writing of many books. And so for a long time, this was his pr one of his uh, primary sources of livelihood. He, uh, he uh, wrote uh, numerous books and pamphlets in addition to this work with, with the tax uh, reporters. And uh, I happened to see a list, uh, there's a list on, on Amazon of the books written by Bill Casey. They had such uh, uh, intriguing titles as Encyclopedia of Mutual Fund Investment Planning and for Security and Profit. Uh, well, probably in 1937 or 38, that was a pretty good book to have. Uh, but I like the one that said, Hidden Gold and Pitfalls in the New Tax Law. I mean, we need somebody writing some of that today. <laughs> how to build and preserve executive wealth. He didn't know how to do that, right, Bernadette? <laughs> and how to raise money to make money. Uh, that too, uh, I'm sure that in education that he developed himself in writing that book was very helpful in heading up the finance and, and fundraising aspects of the campaign later on. But of course, uh, Bill wrote many other books as well. One of them was a book on, on the history of the American Revolution. Uh, and then, of course, the book that you have with you today, uh, which is entitled uh, The Secret War Against Hitler. One other uh, book that I found most intriguing, excuse me. I didn't, I didn't obey that uh, requirement, you turn them off. There we go. <laughs> no, did I say something wrong? Uh, <laughs> And that was a book called Scouting the Future. And the reason that it portrays his writing is it was a collection, a compilation of Bill's speeches. It was put together by his friend Herb Meyer. And, was just, and each of those speeches uh, portrays uh, Bill's thinking at a particular time on, on, or on a particular subject. Uh, and it in itself is, is valuable reading, particularly on the subjects of, of national security in the Cold War and the many other speeches that he gave. And indeed, uh, he did have this knack. Uh, as a matter of fact, the clarity of his writing was in inverse proportion to the clarity of his speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Bill obviously uh, could articulate things very well, but he had a habit, if he wasn't particularly interested in what, what the listener was, was uh, thinking, uh, and sometimes in dealing with the press and people who did not have a particular right to know, uh, he did tend to mumble. Uh, and, and as uh, one of uh, my colleagues on the cabinet said, that Bill Casey has one built-in security system, and that is he doesn't need a scrambler on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I hope uh, you can see from this uh, brief commentary on, on a good friend, Bill Casey. Uh, he was a remarkable person as a friend. He was a remarkable person as a, uh, as a leader. Uh, his contributions to the country were great. Uh, he re was recognized in many ways. He received the Distinguished Intelligence Medal uh, for his work in both in the OSS uh, cumulatively and his work in, in the Central Intelligence Agency. He received the William J. Donovan Award. 
He received honorary degrees from a number of, of universities, all tributes to a remarkable life, a remarkable experience, and remarkable contributions. But I think that in many ways, uh, what he did for our country uh, was best summed up uh, by uh, the words from the Center for Security Policy when they said that William Casey, from his role as Chief of Secret Intelligence in Europe for the Office of, Se of uh, Strategic Services to his extraordinary stewardship of Ronald Reagan's Central Intelligence Agency, Bill Casey's strategic vision shaped several of the defining moments in American history. His passionate commitment to freedom and the subtle, rarefied strategies he used to help bring it to hundreds of millions of victims of fascist and communist repression is one of the truly great stories of our time. And they went on to say, the blending of this extraordinary man's life experiences made an incalculable difference in both restoring American power and prestige around the world and providing an early warning for the coming abuses and security concerns associated with international trade, finance, energy, and technology. This is today our opportunity on the 100th anniversary of his birth to celebrate a truly great man. Like all of us, I particularly feel indebted to him for so many things. And so I'm proud to join you in paying this tribute to Bill Casey, a friend, a mentor, a leader, a benefactor, and most of all, a patriot. Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand our procedure now is to um, retire back into the auditorium where we're going to have two panels.